Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. We have a few announcements this morning. Okay, so May 31st, Soup Kitchen at St. James. Um, contact Paul Smith for details, and this will be the last one until September. Any other announcements? Okay, our centering words for today, God gave us the Holy Spirit that we might be witness to all the world that what Christ has done at the cross and resurrection, he has done for all. We'll have the service of the Aquilate. <laughs> Please stand if you're able and let's join together in the call to worship. Lord, our hearts are on fire this day. Set the blazes of hope that burn away fear. Lord, we come here to be empowered to serve you. Cause the winds of change to blow away doubt and alienation. Praise to God who has brought us the Holy Spirit. Let us worship and rejoice, for God is challenging and empowering us this day. Please join me in the opening prayer. Spirit, Spirit of, of wind and fire, come, come to us, us this day, freeing us from our fears. Lift, lift us up when we have fallen, dust us off, and set us squarely on the path to hope you have set before us. Remind us that we are never far from your presence. Get us ready for the great adventure and opportunities that lie before us. Help us to be good and willing workers for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is Sweet, Sweet Spirit, and it's on page 334. Your hymnal. Mm -hmm. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know the presence of because together we possess all that we need in order to bless God's world. So join me as we prepare to bless the offering by first singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him all the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy God of wind and flame, set us on fire this morning as we celebrate that explosion of your Holy Spirit coming into the world on that amazing day of Pentecost. Remind us that the gift you gave that day was not just the gift to speak in different tongues, but also 
the most wonderful gift received of hearing and comprehension. May your Holy Spirit keep us attuned to the voices all around us, to those who need us to be bearers of your love and compassion. And may these gifts that we give be helpful through your church, and may they meet those needs and those wants. It's in the holy name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Our children's message is a really fun way for you to explain what the day of Pentecost is and what it means to children. And you can even use some really use easy props that pretty much you can pick up in a store. They look like this. But it is based on Acts uh, 2, verses 1 to 21, and it's called Filled with the Holy Spirit. So today's a very special day, and it's the day of Pentecost. It was the day that God sent his Holy Spirit into the world in order to breathe life into the church so that the church could be all that it was meant to be. Just like these balloons, what are the balloons meant to be? They're meant to be filled with air, right? They're meant to be filled. They're meant to be big, tied off, and have fun with, right? You can play Hit the, hit the ball in the house and not break things usually, typically, if you're good. Um, but it's certainly meant to do something, and that's not it. So this is kind of a representation of what the church looked like before the Holy Spirit came. So before God sent the Holy Spirit, the church was not filled with life, kind of like those balloons. And the church wasn't witnessing, wasn't telling people about Jesus. And after the Holy Spirit breathed life into the church, the people began telling everyone that they saw about Jesus. And it kind of reminds me of this picture. I love this. The little girl, she's first, she's got a balloon, and it's got a little air in it. Now, to me, that kind of reminds me of the people who would be outside when you hear the passage from uh, the book of Acts later, and you hear about the flaming tongues and those many languages being poured out of that upper room on the wind and carried to those waiting ears, they were receiving a little bit of that breath, that Holy Spirit. So I kind of see her as kind of taking that, that first little picture on the left. And then in the second one, I see her as breathing out, just like those disciples did, going and sharing, telling people about Jesus and allowing Holy Spirit to use her and breathe some life into her own balloon, but then also into others, because you can see she's going to take that balloon and maybe she's going to go find someone else and give them a little bit of, of that Holy Spirit. But everyone they told about Jesus understood what they were saying. You'll hear that in the passage a little later. And thousands were added to the church that day. It's really important, though, that you remember not everyone was added. And you will hear that there were still mocking people present. We should never be surprised if there are people mocking whenever we're actually helping someone understand something about God, because I believe we hear that so that we understand to be prepared for that. But nonetheless, thousands of people were added to the church that day and the church became alive. So what once looked like this looked like this. So when we are doing the things God commands us to do, when we allow ourselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, we're breathing life into that balloon, we can remember that just as that balloon needs breath to be filled to be what it was intended to be, what it was created to be, we need Holy Spirit to fill us so that we can be all that God created us to be. So let us pray. We thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for breathing life into the church. We thank you for the fact that you are breathing new life into the church in different places and in different ways. And so we thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to all who believe in Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's children said, amen. Uh, but we'll go to God and we will share what's on our heart this morning and then we will all pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, you created the earth, you created the universe, you created all things. There's nothing and no one that is outside 
outside of your control. When it comes to those who decide to offer their lives to you and surrender that control to your wisdom. The bars of our prisons tend to melt with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we praise and thank you for the fulfillment of the promise made by your son, Jesus, that when he returned to you, we would have a counselor, a guide. Now, we thought we could never feel any greater joy than what was felt Easter day when the good news of Jesus' resurrection first met our ears. But that advocate surpasses all that. You've come to us in our imprisonment and freed us. And there are people who do not understand how free they are. They live in the imprisonment created by other human beings. They don't live in the freedom of knowing you. You've given us a voice of power and hope to proclaim the good news to all who will hear. You've poured into our lives the Holy Spirit to be with us always. And these things are so amazing. It's why we celebrate this today. It's the birthday of Jesus, church. And we ask that you would be with all of those dear ones who are facing illness, for all of those who mourn, for those who feel lost and alone, for those who hurt in so many ways, especially tomorrow, for those who hurt over the loss of one who died in uniform. We help us to reach out to them, reach out with loving kindness, the kind that Jesus talks about when he explains to the Pharisees, <sighs> Grace and mercy are greater things than those sacrifices they make on those bloody altars. Strengthen us for the times ahead. We're going to need it. And give us courage to proclaim your love with our very lives. All good begins with prayer. So let us now share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we go to our scripture today, we begin in the book of John chapter 7. This is when Jesus first appears to those frightened disciples and breathes his Holy Spirit onto them. This is prior to that day of Pentecost. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who be believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The second passage comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. And this is when Jews from every nation receive God's Holy Spirit. And this was a very new thing. So hear these words. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. And were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why 
are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In our final reading, Paul writes to the church in Corinth about diverse gifts of the Spirit. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're looking at how mindsets were changed, how they were reformed, how they were worked on by those first Christians, just coming together and learning together from scratch how to live out the call in their lives to follow Jesus' way. What does that community look like? And so your challenge by the end of the message is to determine the mindset of the church body here in the building and also your individual personal mindset. Which way do you lean amongst the two choices? There are many different mindsets. We don't include them all. and We don't claim these are the only two that exist in a certain area. We're just simply saying, do you lean more in one or more in the other? And they are, for the congregation, do we have a control mindset? Whoever is in leadership gets to do things just the way they want. Now, the way that that looks is every time you change a leader, the entire structure changes. Or does the church have a release mindset? Whoever is in leadership seeks to discern what God wants them to do. In that way, there is 
tending to be a lot more consistency. For personal mindsets, we're considering physical or spiritual. A physical mindset says, if I can't see it, feel it, or touch it, it's not that important to me. A spiritual mindset says there is much more to life than what I can see, feel, or touch. I understand that spiritual forces are more influential than the physical world around me. You know, the physical world around us tends to get us on the outside and, and sometimes on the inside, but it's the spiritual that really affects us internally, mentally, emotionally. And so we, we do have to really think about whether we hold a physical or spiritual mindset, which way do we really tend to lean. And today is a good day to consider these two mindsets because we saw in those readings how they were gelling together. Those leaders, those first leaders that were in that upper room, they were just, they just became the ad board without realizing it. They became the church leaders and they are all individuals, and they have changed as individuals as well. But it's a good day because they're gathered in this rented room, and they're praying. They're waiting for God to move. They've learned patience. To this point, they have now learned patience. Peter's not at the window going, God, when are you coming? We got things to do. We, uh, we're on a schedule. Peter has changed, and all the rest have as well. They understand patience, and Jesus told them to go and wait. And so they are obeying, they have gone, they are praying, they are waiting. Individually, they've matured in their discipleship because their mindsets have changed and they continue to change as you see them growing in their discipleship throughout the, the New Testament. This particular day of Pentecost, because this of course comes every year for them, but this particular day, they are far less concerned than on any other day of Pentecost in their entire lives about their own physical wants. They are less concerned about how they feel. They're less concerned about all of those things that are physical than they are spiritual needs that Jesus has called them to attend to. As a group, there are no more discussions about which one is Jesus' favorite, who gets to be in charge, because they have all learned a very important lesson. Servants aren't in charge. They serve the one who is. And in that passage from Acts, it's the first time that they get to step up and stand out without Jesus standing with them physically. And what a whirlwind this created. Although there were detractors and there were those murmuring and there were those accusing, 3,000 hearts were opened that day. That wind was pretty powerful. Wind itself can be very powerful. I learned that when I was in my house, I think it was maybe the fifth or sixth year I'd been living there. I'd grown pretty accustomed because, well, we all know the power of wind. First of all, in the Valley, we have three major holidays. They are Christmas, Easter, and Grange Fair. And we remember, it was probably like 20 years ago. Do you remember the storm that blew through Center Hall and those heavy army trees? Some were in the, there's heavy army trees. <laughs> Heavy army tents. I don't know if the trees are from the army or not, but I can tell you the tents were army issue and they ended up in the trees. So that was some pretty powerful wind. And living near the fairgrounds, we have had a couple of really intense storms. I remember when that storm came through, we were at our in-laws uh, over at Mary Kay and Wally's out on the sun deck having lunch and just hanging out there. And I remember one of their trees snapped in half and we went home and this one beautiful shrub that we had out front was spiraled right down. It was absolutely amazing, just incredible. But it was before that, earlier than that, the first really weird storm, I learned something very important. I learned that first of all, I was used to storms coming from one of two directions. It's either blowing at this end of the house or blowing to this end of the house. You know, it was always the same. You could kind of tell by which direction it was coming. And I was used to my own little routine. So the kids were young. They were in elementary school, but it was summertime and they were off. So they were home and I worked at home at that time. So we enjoyed the day and we saw a storm coming. So we got everything inside the house that could blow away. And I got them set up at the dining room table with their snacks. And they're going to watch a movie on the laptop while the storm blows through. And then I went about closing windows because until about two years ago, the Heiser house didn't have air conditioning. And uh, so we had our windows open pretty much all the time. But you know how you have that pattern, you know where the wind typically blows the rain in. And so you hit those windows first. So I did my usual routine. I closed up those windows first 
And uh, well, then I went to the other side of the house. Now it's important to understand that there are only two rooms that had windows open at this point. And it's the bathroom, which is in the back of the house and the master bedroom, which is the front corner of the house. The winds typically would come down off the mountain and hit the other side of the house first. So, okay, so now I'm attending to the back of the house. The bathroom window was very well protected, which is why I was always going there last. Not only is it uh, further in the back of the house, but we've also built an addition. So the addition actually protected it from wind coming off the mountain and it has an awning on it. <laughs> the window itself is about this wide when it's open, maybe this tall when it's open. So needless to say, that is the last window that I would close because it's so well protected. But on this particular day, I learned that the wind can shift and boy, can it change because if that wind is going along the mountain, right? If it's traveling with the mountain, it, it gains speed, a lot of speed. So I am walking back my hallway. I've closed the other two bedroom windows and I'm heading back toward my uh, master bedroom. And I realize standing in the doorway, looking into my bedroom that my back is getting wet. And I'm getting hit with wind. You know, it's the whole hair blowing like this kind of thing. And it's like, this is really weird. And you ever have something happen where it's so shocking, it's just not what you're expecting at all. And it takes a second for you to go, what is happening? And so I got a hold of myself and it's like, that is wind and rain. That should not be happening. But the only windows open in the house was the bathroom window and the bedroom windows. So that wind had one place to come in, one place to go out. And so it was, wind was doing what the wind does. So I turn around, okay, change of plans. I'm gonna close the bathroom window first. I truck down the hallway. And as I get to the door, it does that scary movie thing where the bathroom door goes slam. So glad the children are watching a video because I know the look on my face was from a horror film. And it was like, okay, really wasn't expecting that. And couldn't even understand really how the door didn't blow sh shut earlier. But anyway, open the door, go in, close the window, turn around, assess the damage. Ceiling, bone dry. Everything else, soaking wet. Carry everything out. I'm getting other towels out, drying things off. The bathroom had never been that clean, I think, from the day we moved in. Okay, young kids, you know what I'm saying. We weren't wiping down walls all the time. But anyway, bathroom is nice and cleaned up, but it was the most amazing thing. The power of that wind was absolutely incredible. And several weeks after the resurrection, the same kind of powerful, impactful wind that does something you are not expecting at all blows into Jerusalem where the followers of Christ were obedient to his command to go and pray and wait. They prayed in that room. They talked in that room. They waited on the Holy Spirit to come, pondering in their hearts all that brought them to this place and this time. As a young church body individually and together, they were ready for the next movement. They were ready to see what this Holy Spirit thing is going to be. What's it going to do? You know, what is our next step? How is this going to go? And at precisely the right moment and not a moment before, Holy Spirit makes a very loud, not at all what was expected by anyone inside or outside that room appearance in the form of a very intense attention-getting wind. And then those tongues of fire that appeared over their heads, you know, eyes are drawn to light. So even if it's, if it's daylight, you can see a fire. Amen. You can see a fire from far off, even if it's daylight. You, you can be attracted to it. So I have no doubt some of those outside the room saw the tongues of fire. And then all of a sudden, these people who are gathered outside who comprehend in different languages are hearing and understanding what was being poured out through those disciples and carried on that wind because we know wind carries voice. Jesus got in a boat so that the winds coming off of the water would reach the people on the shore. Wind carries voice, and that wind was carrying all of those voices, speaking those different languages, to those waiting, available, and willing ears. And also to those ears of the mockers, interesting to include. But now imagine you're in that upper room, words are pouring out of your mouth that you know you didn't put there. 
in a language you've never studied and yet you understand every word. Well, you know that's, that's not you. That's something, but that is not you. A lot of us have real life experience of storms and wind that leave us in awe because of their sheer power, blowing tents into trees and rain through my house. And we, we believe that certain things are unmovable, they're unshakable, certain things can never be destroyed. And then along comes a wind and tears down what we thought was permanent. Did you ever think you were unmovable? Is there something that's in your life that you just cannot get past it? You just cannot get past this stronghold that will not seem to go away? Is there a generation you feel is unmovable? Did you ever believe that you couldn't ever really comprehend the word of God because the version of the word of God you were told is the only one you should ever dare open is written in a language you do not speak? I remember trying to read that little Bible when I was in elementary school, the little red Bible they gave you at school. I know it was English, but I couldn't understand a word. How sad that was for me. It is interesting to remember how this whole story unfolds. These people that don't understand the language that those disciples spoke needed to hear it, and God knew it and created a way for that to happen. We have every kind of translation of our Bible in, in almost every language of the world now so that people can read it and comprehend what it says. It makes so much sense because we see Jesus comes to us as we are because he understands us and he understands why we are, where we are, and how we got there. He speaks to us in a way that gets through to us. Why would he speak to us in a way that wouldn't? So doesn't it make sense that the church too, the church that Jesus was sent to establish would do the same? You know, there's not one word about any description of those people gathered outside, that there's nothing about their dress, there's nothing about their jobs, there's not even anything written about their ages. There's nothing written about whether or not they are the worst sinner or the best sinner in the whole wide world. Just that not a single person, even those that were ready to mock it, every single one was able to hear the word of God was poured out for all who had ears to hear, which is why the day of Pentecost is considered the birth of Jesus' church, because it sent that new message. God wants to connect with everyone. There was an article that was written. It was, it was printed in the Washington Post December 26th. I think the reason it was, it was in on December 26th was because... Uh, I think people get confused about Jesus' birthday and the church's birthday. And so she wrote this article called, The Church is Not the Building, It's Our Faith and Our People. And you'll see what I mean. I think that that's my theory about why she had it written and put in that day after Christmas. And it says, I quote, We call it the birthday of the church, as if the tongues of flame were as benign as little birthday candles. But imagine the faithful friends of Jesus, shocked, terrified, transfixed, and amazed. Imagine thousands more in the neighborhood caught up in a storm of God's power, a manifestation of the Spirit of God promised by Jesus. We want a soft hand, a gentle breeze, a kindly prompt about our spiritual gifts and how to use them. And sometimes we get that. We prefer the peace of the predictable. We don't want to lose what we're accustomed to. We prefer to stay put, even when we know things are less than satisfactory. Moving into the unknown is risky. Even as the wind swirls around us, sounding like a freight train, the vibrations shaking the building, we hang on to what we know. We hope the storm will go by and leave us huddled safely in the basement. But when conditions are right, when we give ourselves totally over to God and pray sincerely to be guided and to be put to use, we need to watch out for the tornado that is coming. 
The Holy Spirit will change a church. When the Spirit shows up, we will be moved. Wind whipped, we cannot go back to our lives as if nothing has happened. When our inward lives have become illuminated by God's flame, blown open by God's wind, our outward lives have to respond, end quote. I can't tell you what I looked like the day that the rain blew through my house, but I can tell you I didn't look the same as I did before the rain blew through my house. My hair was wet. The back of my shirt was soaked. I remember that very well because it was a lot of rain. The carpet in the hallway was wet, the floors and the walls and the bathroom were wet, but me, I looked different too. And I would love to have had a picture of my face when that door slammed shut. Now, the reason I say that is because I would love to know what it looked like when the wind died down. I would imagine if I was in that upper room and having all that wind blow through, I would go about doing what Teresa would normally do. It would be, oh, the curtains are up. I'm gonna go pull the curtains back down. I'm gonna pull these beads down in the doorway. Oh, we've got papers that have blown over here. I'm gonna pick things up because the room is a mess, right? But I think that both the people in that room and the people outside were changed. I bet that their robes were askew. I bet that their wraps were probably undone head pieces and head wraps were probably a little askew. Certainly hairdos were undone and beards might've even gone ast astray, who knows. I think that they would have had looks on their faces, both the disciples in that room, as they looked at each other for confirmation, did that really just happen? And the people outside who heard it looking at each other, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? What does this mean? I bet everyone looked very different than before that wind blew through. I bet they had that look on their face of someone who has experienced something life-changing, not something interesting. I think that the people who were mocking thought, hmm, that's interesting, totally missed it. They were looking, but they did not see, and they were listening, and they did not hear. Know why? They didn't want to. Oh, the things that we miss when we don't want to see and we don't want to hear. But I really believe those people outside especially were impacted. It was their first taste of that movement of Jesus that's been going ever since. It was their very first taste of it. They'd never experienced anything that was supernatural. So as we wrestle with the sharing of the good news with especially younger generations who clearly do not speak our language, nor do we speak theirs in fairness. They do not sing our songs, nor do we sing theirs in fairness. How willing are we to surrender our preferred ways? both personally and as the body of Christ so that Holy Spirit can be poured out, so that Holy Spirit can take over and actually show us how to communicate the way God knows will reach them. Are we willing? At the end of the article that Patricia Sullivan wrote was an interesting thought, I think is a very timely one. And I quote, is there a significant risk that the Holy Spirit will blow into this church like the rush of a violent wind? Are the conditions right? End quote. Are the conditions right? Are we waiting for God to show us our next faithful steps? Or are we waiting for the world to show us what to be mad at next? Are the conditions right? We certainly know that to reach a generation is going to require more than the pastor's involvement. We see that the disciples are left behind. Their pastor has gone to heaven. And they are now stepping into leadership. They have to go about asking God, what is it that we are to do? And many of us are leaders in the church. We have to ask God, what is it that we are to do? 
Paul writes about this to the church in Ephesus, which speaks to the fact we all have individual parts to play as well as being the community of Christ together. He wrote this, the gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, but all to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Guess who the saints are? If you remember anything today, you can tell people, what did you learn at church? I'm a saint. <laughs> all to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. So as we answer our mindset inventory questions today, maybe the better question to ask is, are the conditions right? Do we have the mindset that builds the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven? Or are there things we have to surrender, things that we just have to get past? Or we have to set aside, we have to put it down. Because it wasn't the wind that moved the hearts on that day of Pentecost. It was the message carried by that wind, pouring from those disciples about Christ that reached waiting, hungering ears and opened their minds and hearts for the first time. It did. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you've been given to us so that we might give the news to all. The news that Jesus Christ is raised and is reigning and that he is savior of all. Empower us by your gracious gifts so that we might say and show the good news of Jesus Christ to all, so that everyone in every corner of our world will know of your determination to reach and to embrace everyone so that they might turn to you. Forgive us when we limit the boundaries of your reign, when we erect barriers or make it difficult for others to see you and hear Jesus because of us. We know that you want more than us in our congregation. You want all. You want all to know the truth. Those 10 commandments are commandments, not suggestions. And the truth of the Bible cannot be changed because a society says it should be so. Humble us. Equip us and empower us to be the willing vessels of your powerful, authentic word so that all who are out there may hear. Amen. Would you please rise in body or spirit as you are able and turn to number 335 as we extend an invitation to the Holy Spirit individually and as the body of Christ. O oh God, the Holy Spirit, come to us and among us. Come as the wind and cleanse us. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the dew and refresh. Convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to our great good and to thy greater glory. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Would you now please turn to number 420 to sing together, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life and truth. That I may love. And do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure. Until with thee, I will, one will, to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God. Shall I never die? But live 
very interesting when I totally surrendered myself to God's will and to be used by God. And one of those things was words came out of my mouth. I had no idea how they got there. And the reason I say that is because they were not words that I would have said. I was jaded. I was harmed by the world. I spoke a certain way and I sounded a lot more like the world. But suddenly I was speaking in a way that was not of the world. And that's how we know we have surrendered ourselves to Holy Spirit. Go now in the joy of the Spirit. Feel the power of the holy wind and fire in your lives. Go forth into God's world as God's own children, emboldened and encouraged by this power, and encourage others. Amen. Thank you. 